If you'll open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, and then flip over to Matthew chapter 1, and just stick your finger there and hold it. I have several, we're not going to read long passage, but a couple places, because we're reading about two different dads this morning. So Luke chapter 1, then Matthew chapter 1. And this morning in Luke chapter 1, we want to look at verses 11 through 13, and then we'll drop down to verse 59. Luke chapter 1 and verse 11. This is the word of God. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. Now drop down to verse 59 of that first chapter. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Now flip back over to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Remember the angel appears to Joseph, who is betrothed to Mary. You all know the story. Usually we only hear it at Christmas. Verse 21, Matthew chapter 1. The angel said to Joseph, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And then verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home in his wi as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. It seems as though a father of five came home one evening with one toy. And he gathered his children around him and he said, Which one of you was the most obedient today? Which one did not backtalk their mama? Which one did everything your mother asked them to do today? And the children quietly looked from one to the other, and finally they just looked up at their dad and says, Daddy, you play with it. <laughs> what do you remember the most about your dad? That's a loaded question these days because sometimes dads weren't the best. But hopefully as we mature, we can see at least one good thing in our dads, hopefully lots of good things, but everybody didn't have a good dad. But just because some people didn't doesn't mean that those who did should not honor their dads. And I was thinking about that as I prepared this sermon, and I thought, what is it about your dad that stands out to you? And I, the first thing that came, and that's just been true, is my dad would always do what he thought was right. No matter how hard that was, he would do what he thought was right. And now I'm not saying that was always right, but it's what he thought was right. And he would do it. And my backside had plenty of red marks to prove it. Uh, some of those, in fact, most of those were deserved. And he would always say, I don't like doing this. I never believed it till I had a child of my own. And then I understood a little bit better what he was experiencing. It's not always easy to do what's right. Sometimes we'd rather go to the timeout corner than send our child there. Sometimes we'd rather be grounded than ground our child. Sometimes we'd rather someone took our car keys than to take those of our child. But you do what you have to do to do the right thing if you love your kids. In our scripture this morning, there are two very, very different fathers. 
But there's one thing we learn from them that we must practice if we would be godly parents, godly grandparents. They both possess this quality. They both were obedient to God, wholeheartedly obedient to God in some of the most difficult circumstances. And so this morning, I want us to look at these two dads very briefly, but we'll learn much from them, remembering that the most important quality your child can see in you is a wholehearted obedience to Jesus Christ. The first thing I want us to see is how different they were. See some of the contrasts in them, and we'll just look at three real quickly. They were very different in age. Zechariah was old. Remember, he was an old man, and like Abraham, God blessed him in his old age. He and his wife, she too was old. They were going to have a son. You remember in that culture, to have a son meant that you were blessed of God. Because they had no children, it is obvious that one of them was sterile. So this is a miracle not only that in their old age they can have a child, but in spite of the sterility of one of them, they would have a child. On the other hand, Joseph is a much younger man, a man of childbearing age. Engaged to a young woman that I have no doubt he loved dearly, but who now reveals, the angel reveals, that she is with child by the Holy Spirit. Do you think that would cause your jaw to drop? Yeah. Zechariah, old hearing from God. Joseph, much, much younger, but still, too, hearing from God. Secondly, they were very different in their occupations. Zechariah was a priest. He dealt with the things of God. Joseph was a carpenter. Now, we think of carpentry as a much more specialized field these days. In those days, when you were a carpenter, it meant from going and cutting down the tree to fashioning the wood to shaping those pieces and making the finished product. That was a carpenter. So when we say Jesus was a carpenter, I don't see him with his little DeWalt power kit and his great, you know, home... Uh, Workshop like on TV, you know, Norm Abrams has one of those shops. Well, he is the best of the best, and he can build this magnificent piece of furniture in 25 minutes. I couldn't build that in 25 lifetimes. But he's got this magnificent, wonderful workshop. But you look at these two, Joseph was much more primitive. Jesus was a man who was incredibly strong because carpenters had to be strong to wrestle the wood before they could even make something out of it. Two very different dads. And finally, they were from different regions of the country. Zechariah was from the hill country in the southern part of Israel. Joseph was from Nazareth in the northern section of Israel. Two very different dads. But what stands out to me is not their differences, but their similarities. And when you look at these two fathers, you see some incredible similarities. Both were becoming fathers under unique circumstances. This was not the norm for parenthood. Zechariah's wife was past the age of childbearing They'd never had children. They'd longed for children. They'd prayed for children. It didn't happen. And now they're going to have a miracle baby. Mary's child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Another miracle baby. But that's not how the world would see it. Joseph, the Bible says, was a righteous man. He would marry her. Raise her child, give that child his name, knowing it was not his child. Mm -hmm. 
They both came to parenting under some very, very different and unique circumstances. Both were visited by angels. Angels appeared to both of these men telling them what God had instructed. And they were told to give specific names to their sons. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. These sons would be the firstborn. And those of you who've been with us on Wednesday night as we've studied some of these things, remember that the firstborn had additional responsibility. The firstborn would be responsible for the family, for carrying out the family name. The family would endure one more generation through the firstborn. And so often children were given the names of their fathers. We do that in this generation. Some of you are junior. You have the exact same name of your father, except it's junior. I've known some who were the third. I've never known anybody who was the fourth. In western Kentucky, we didn't have too many of those kind of families. So, <laughs> You see, the name of the firstborn and the firstborn himself meant that this family would continue. That was the hope of the family for another generation. And the firstborn, while having some privilege, also had great responsibility. If the father was unable to rule over the family, the firstborn assumed that position, making decisions for the family. When the father died, the firstborn was responsible for the care of his mother and any unmarried sisters. That's why at the cross, Jesus looks to John and says, Behold your mother. He is doing what he is supposed to do. Fulfilling his responsibility as the firstborn to provide for his mother. Any unmarried sisters, he was to take care of. And feel the role of a father to them. He received an extra share of the inheritance. So that he could fulfill those responsibilities in caring for his family. The angel visited them both. And said, you name your firstborn son this. To Zechariah, he said, you name your son John. We go, well, there's lots of Johns around. Why John? John means Yahweh is gracious. And this John would be a living testimony that God was gracious to Zechariah and Elizabeth, but even more so as he fulfilled his ministry as John the baptizer, John the Baptist. The forerunner of the Christ. The one who came preparing the way of the Lord. People would look back like us and see that God was indeed gracious in the giving of this child. To Joseph, the angel said, you take Mary for the child within her is of the Holy Spirit conceived of God. And you give him the name Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, Yahweh saves. For he will save his people from their sins. Not just any names. Specific names, but not family names. I wonder if Joseph ever thought, look, isn't it enough that I'm taking this child? That I'm going to bear the ridicule of this? And then I can't even name him after myself? Probably not. But I wonder. And the most important similarity between these two fathers is that they both obeyed. You remember Zechariah says, how can this be? And the angel says, because you doubted, you will be mute. You can't speak until that child is born. So he couldn't speak. And so it came time that the child was circumcised and named. And they looked to Elizabeth because Zechariah couldn't speak. And 
They said, what's his name going to be? John. And they all took a step back. John? There's nobody in your family named John. And they looked to the father. Because the father named the child. What's his name? And he called for a writing tablet. And he says, his name is John. He obeyed the name the angel told him to give to the boy. Is the name the boy got. He was completely obedient. Joseph took Mary, loved her and honored her and honored God, did not know her physically until that child was born, and he gave him the name Jesus. And if you go over into Luke chapter 2, you read that when he was circumcised, they gave him the name Jesus. There we go, but it's not Joseph Jr., not little Joe. No, his name is Jesus. They were both completely obedient to what God had instructed them to do. Now before we go, there are two lessons we draw from these two dads. And the first is that God's calling to all of us is the same. And that is to be obedient. And his first calling is always to come to Christ. He has sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And he says, come to him that you might have life. That's the first calling. And the condemnation will be that we heard the good news, we heard the call of God, and we said no. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The first calling to all of us is to receive this Christ, turn from our sins, call upon him for salvation, and experience that new birth. And then walk in obedience like these two dads. The second lesson we see is that obedience is evidence of our faith in God. No matter how difficult it is to obey him. I don't think it was easy for Joseph to do what he did. This went against the grain of everything he had been taught. But he obeyed. Because God commanded, he obeyed. He didn't necessarily understand all that was going on. Zechariah didn't either. But both of these dads obeyed completely what God had commanded them to do. It was Hudson Taylor, the pioneer missionary to China. If you've never read his biography, get an old copy and read it. It'll bless your heart. How he ever made it there is a miracle. How he stayed is another one. And the gospel and now we see the fruits today in China where some say they're the largest number of Christians in the world. Hudson Taylor, who buried children, buried a wife there, knew the heartache and the struggle, said this, Make up your mind that God is an infinite sovereign and has the right to do as he pleases with his own. And he may not explain to you a thousand things which may puzzle your reason in his dealings with you. He says, he is your God, he is your king, he is your redeemer. And when he commands, you obey, whether you understand or not. And when we obey, we are showing that we trust him. Even when we don't, especially when we don't understand. Now what about you? Have you obeyed his first calling, and that is to receive Christ? 
Having done that, have you obeyed his call to follow him in all things? Say, God, I don't want to do that. That's not the question. Do it. It's not always easy to obey God. It's not always easy to follow him. We cannot see what lies around the bend. But we trust him who holds us as we walk with him the journey of faith. Are you obedient? Lord, give us grace to follow you with all our hearts, no matter what you ask. It's amazing. Joseph was naming his own Savior. That's wild, isn't it? What about you? What's God called you to do? Are you willing to say yes? How will your children ever learn to follow God with all their heart if you don't? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these two obedient dads. I'm sure they didn't understand what you were up to, but they trusted you, and they obeyed you, and they were blessed. Oh, Lord, would you move in our hearts? Those of us who know you, may we be obedient. And, Lord, if there's even one here who doesn't know you, may they say yes to Jesus. Not just to a concept, but to a person a personal Savior. Say, I want to be new. I want you to save me and change me. Oh God, help us to walk in the power of your Spirit that we might be obedient, pointing our children every day in every way to Jesus. And that we ask in his name. Amen.